The Edmonton Oilers stayed alive with a big win at home in game four. Can the Oilers get back into the series or will the Florida Panthers win their first ever Stanley Cup? And the NHL's newly relocated franchise picks a first year name and a color scheme. We've got all that and more on today's Locked On NHL podcast. Your Locked On NHL, your daily podcast on the National Hockey League. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Gil Martin here and welcome everybody to the Monday edition of the Locked On NHL Podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I want to thank everyone who makes Locked On NHL your first listen every day. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts so you can get new episodes as soon as they drop. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. It is my pleasure to welcome back to the show the host of Locked On Oilers, Nick Zoraris. And uh, Nick, the Oilers weren't quite ready to head into the offseason just yet. A big 8-1 to one win in Game 4 in Edmonton to stay alive. I mean, the margin aside, what was the biggest difference in this game as compared to Games 1 through 3? They finally got a bounce. It, it, it sounds very weird to say that in a game the final score was 8-1. to one. The Oilers couldn't buy a bounce for three straight games. You know, it, It's insane. The Oilers had basically no offense for three straight games, and this is the second highest scoring team in the regular season and the highest scoring team on a per game basis in the playoffs to the point of the Stanley cup final. Bob is a, probably a hall of fame goalie and Florida is undoubtedly the best defensive team in the league. It is really difficult to consistently generate offense and actually convert those chances. It's not that the Oilers have played terribly. It's that Florida's, preferred style what they're good at it just makes it really difficult to make offense you know you got to work a lot harder to string together a sequence to set something up I know there was a sequence in game three when the Oilers were getting back into the game where they were a six on four it's taken like seven or eight passes to set up one scoring chance if you have to string together that many passes to get one clean look it's gonna be really hard to score consistently and for once, they got some bounces. You know, they got a shorthanded goal that got them kind of in the game, got their feet under them. And that's been an issue for them at times that Florida gets out to the lead. They're chasing the entire game, and it's difficult to play from behind the entire game. Yes, you have some advantages because Florida will retract a little bit. They'll play a little more defensive. But if they're in that shell, even if you have the puck the entire game like they did in game one, if it doesn't go in, it doesn't matter. Ultimately, they got some bounces. They they were due for some bounces. You just didn't expect eight of them to go in. You know, you talk about bounces. To me, the biggest one was right before that shorthanded goal. Uh, Florida hit two posts on yeah. that power play, and then boom, it goes the other way. Shorthanded goal, big change in momentum. What about Connor McDavid? Uh, sets a new record breaking Wayne Gretzky, of all people, uh, for most assists in a Stanley Cup playoff. And yet, for him, the focus is all on the team. He understands. He's he's got the Sid robot in him. He's not that quite he's not as neurotic as Sid is about it, but this has been his entire life. His entire life has been to get to this moment as the next guy, you know, to assume that mantle with Sid, with Gretzky, with Lemieux, with Lindros, the next Canadian savior, if you will. He's been preparing for this moment his entire life. He's always gonna be about the team, about the team, because He's that's what the guys before him have always done. You know, it's not it's not so much that he doesn't have feelings about this. It's that he understands that if they're going to make something insane happen here, that it's going to take every single one of them to get back in the series and anything he can do to pump up other guys that need it more than him. He knows what he's going to do. He knows he's going to go out there and he's going to do everything he can. But for other guys, you know, for the other people on the team who aren't the best player in the world, that little bit of a nudge that pat on the back that means a lot that's how you stay keep a group engaged and he doesn't get a lot of credit for his leadership because he's more of a lead by example type because he is the best player in the world 
but he's undoubtedly got a good feel for what the room needs because whenever they've had issues, he will say something to that effect of we'll be okay. You know, the, the, I know Oiler fans have been sharing the clip of him and Dreisaitl sitting on the bench back in November, the last game before Woodcroft got fired, where it's, I think, 5-1 to one Carolina. Dreisaitl and McDavid just look at each other. They tap each other on the leg and like, yeah, this sucks, but it's going to be okay. We'll figure this out. And that's what you need sometimes from your leader. No question about that. Talk to me more about some of the stars on Edmonton. I mean, before – Saturday's game that were criticized a little bit for not being as productive in the final. How are they playing though? Even if they're not getting the results, how are the dry sidles, the McDavid's, the Hyman's playing in this series? Florida has done a good job of forcing dry sidle in particular to have to probably play a little more defense than he wants to, where even if Florida's not making offense, they're not scoring. If Dreisaitl's playing defense, he's not dangerous. He's Even if you're not really doing a lot when you're in the zone, if he doesn't have the puck, you're defanging the Oilers. You're taking away what makes them effective. Same thing when McDavid's out there. If they cycle McDavid for 45 seconds, he's off the ice. They, they survived, and they didn't really have to play defense either. They had the puck. I will say, I think we can say you need more from those guys because – that's the Oilers' recipe, if you will. If they're going to be successful, they need the McDavid, Dreisaitl, Hyman, Nugent Hopkins, Bouchard, Ekholm. They need their six, seven guys to be the best players on the ice every single time they're out there because that's their formula. You know, that's how they got here. They that Their stars outplayed Dallas's stars, and that's how they got here. And if they were going to beat Florida, the argument always was, well, McDavid and Dreisaitl are two of the three best players in the series. You think in those minutes they can win. It's simply a matter of how does the depth do? How does the goaltending do in relation to Florida? And it's not that they've played poorly. It's that they've had to work really hard to do anything. You know, we were talking about before, you know, stringing together seven, eight passes in an offensive cycle, getting out of the zone because Florida loves to just hold the puck on you, make you play defense. And even if they don't do anything with it, you're tired. You have to come off and you win that shift. If you get McDavid off the ice in a minute, 10, and he doesn't touch the puck. What do the Oilers have to do to get back into this series? And obviously, you know, two out of the remaining possible three games are in South Florida. Uh, so that's a tall task. But what do they have to do to just get it back to Edmonton for a game six? Let's start with that. Edmonton is a score impacts team. They need to play with a lead because it makes them so much better defensively. When they are in a tie game or they are playing from behind, their defense feels that pressure. The turnovers are a little more frequent. They're trying to break out, and it's not as organized. And Florida is so good defensively that even if you have the puck for the entire game, like they did in game one, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to score. That's the thing that kills you about playing Florida is they have so many different ways they can beat you. Florida is comfortable in a 2-1 rock fight. Florida is comfortable and a 5-4-6-5 shootout. They are really adaptable based on the game situation, whereas Edmonton's path is very narrow. You know, we were just talking about the Stars. They need their Stars to be the best players on the ice every single time they're out there because they can't bank on the Matias Janmarks, the Ryan McLeods, the Corey Perrys, the Adam Henriques. It's great those guys are contributing. You need that if you're going to make a series something. You're going to make something of the series. But if McDavid and Dreisaitl aren't, you know, two points per game, it sounds insane to say that that's the expectation, but it kind of is. That's kind of the Oilers' formula here. And as far as getting back in this series, they absolutely deserve at least one more win based on how they've played. Will they actually get it? That's a different story. But based on the, how they played in the first three games, we can all kind of agree they were due for some bounces. They scored a bunch of goals. And like we said before we started recording, your hope now as an Oilers fan, you hope they didn't score all their goals for the series Saturday night because there's a very real chance the game Monday night is a rock fight. You know, it's two to one and there's no breathing room and it's the kind of game Florida wants. That's That doesn't suit Edmonton particularly well because that puts a lot more pressure on their defense and it puts a lot more pressure on Stuart Skinner. And real quick, I do want to shout out the save Skinner made when it was 1-1 and that's a great save getting over post to post. That They needed that save desperately. That's the first real big save he's made in this series. And that was essential because if it goes to 2-1 Florida right there, 
very different game than Edmonton scoring next. No question about that. All right, Nick, why don't you tell our viewers and our listeners where they could find the podcast and where they could find you on social media? Yeah, Locked On Oilers every day. Going to record an episode right after I get off with Gil for you guys for Monday so we can talk about going into game number five on Twitter at Nick Zararis, Nick Z-A-R-A-R-I-S. Thanks for having me, Gil. All right, Nick, always a pleasure. Thank you. Today's episode is brought to you by Policy Genius. A lot of life is unpredictable, but a good life insurance plan gives your family financial safety to protect against some of the unknowns. Policy Genius is the country's leading online insurance marketplace. It makes choosing the right policy for your family easy and quick. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policy that start at just $292 per year for $1 million of coverage. Some options are 100% online and let you avoid unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius helps you easily compare your options from America's top insurers in just a few clicks. Their award winning agents can even walk you through the process step by step. Get peace of mind by finding the right life insurance with Policy Genius. Head to policygenius.com or click on the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you can save. That's policygenius.com, policygenius.com. It is my pleasure to welcome back to the show a familiar face now to Locked On NHL fans, the host of Locked On Florida Panthers, Armando Velez. And uh, Armando, I, I want to ask you this. Obviously, 8-1, not what you expected going into Saturday night's game four, but is it almost easier for this team that the game was so one-sided? I believe so, because when I think about how this game went for the Florida Panthers versus the first three, I mean, game one, the team, the team was giving up a quite a few odd man rushes, but Sergei Bobrovsky was Sergei Bobrovsky in that game. But I mean, for the Panthers, it was a lot more than, than just the odd man rushes for them. I mean, they're, for the Edmonton Oilers, the puck support was just so great after they won a, their fair share of board battles in their own end. That's really what it came down to for them also fighting off the Florida Panthers forecheck. But when it's uh, it's crazy because one of the goals in the third period uh, on the entry by Corey Perry and Connor McDavid, they didn't even show a slow-mo, but they, the Panthers hesitated to challenge for offside in, in that. But the score was so wide open. Um, the the Edmonton Oilers were just winning by a wide margin. And so I, I, I was wondering whether, whether Paul Maurice didn't want to challenge that because of the fact to, to let a loss like this marinate. So with the two day gap with it going back to sunrise, that it could just fire them up when they're ready to go back home. And what was so different about game four as compared to the first three games, other than the obvious, I mean, Bobrovsky didn't have his a game uh, in game four, but what else was different about it? The superstars for the Edmonton Oilers were able to finish. That was really the 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 big biggest difference in in this one. I mean, all the conversation about Zach Hyman, Connor McDavid, Leon Draisaitl not getting on the board. I mean, you you think about this. I mean, the depth scores were the guys who were getting on the board, like a Matthias Ekholm, uh, Yan Mark, Dylan Holloway, and, and th those are those are the guys who are getting on on the score sheet for uh, for the Oilers and and for the. For Connor McDavid, now he was finishing on on his on his chances. I mean, multi assist game. I mean, he's now two points away from getting to forty points in the postseason. So that that's really what it came down to is that the stars were able to finish. So thankfully for the Panthers, this is a different conversation now versus had they lost Game One too. Because if, if you're if you're coming if you're coming off of this and it's tied two two the alarms might be going off even more. What is the attitude in the Panthers locker room? I mean, they're up three, nothing in the series. You have four chances to win the series. Now there's three. How are they taking? What's the reaction to this loss? I really love what Alexander Barkov said after the game where he said, we either win or we learn. So it's just it, the, the, I, th I think the vibe for the locker, the rock, locker room for the Panthers is that they're actually in a really good place. I feel uh, and and Paul Maurice also talks a lot about emotional advantage for other teams on what happens whenever 
uh, teams' backs against the walls. And he also g- talks about that from the regular season of teams who are on the bubble of, of trying to make the postseason too, or even teams who are facing elimination. The emotional advantage of the Oilers and the Panthers, which it was a wide margin, but now after that, after that, the way they lost, it's a little the the it's a little bit closer now for for the Panthers now that they got a message uh, kind of sent to them after that. Up to three games remaining, two of them would be in South Florida. What would it mean to the fan base and to the team to be able to win the series at home? It would mean everything because I mean with. The Panthers going through a gauntlet of uh, of ownership, relocation rumors, and and also for for them to get this series at home and just to see the growth of hockey where there's already starting there already there's already that practice facility in East Broward County for the practice facility and also for drop in hockey, uh, learn to play everything there. And also the fact that there's also another rink being uh, built up north in Palm Beach Gardens. I mean, with the Florida Panthers winning the Stanley Cup, that would just mean so much for registration on the youth level too. kids being kids being brought to games and saying, I want to do that, too. So that's that's really the inspiring. uh, That's the inspiration that a, a Stanley Cup run would would be for the Florida Panthers. And then fans who've been following this team for three decades, being able to see the Stanley Cup raised in their own building has would have to be special yeah and 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 to think about what the team's inception being in in downtown miami too and then the move to sunrise uh and trying just trying to find their identity and then the whole the whole talk about players come wanting to come here to retire versus versus actually wanting to contend too that's another thing for the the it is changed to this one thing that that Matthew Caldwell, the president of the Florida Panthers, talks about is to be a destination franchise. Bill Zito also preaches that. They also preach about the the region of Broward County. They want to be from the Everglades to the Palm Beaches. It's like widespread that they want to be for for what they're building for for the for the team. So it's been it's they've this team has really come a long way. So what are the keys for the Panthers to end this series in five games? What what do they need to do to win this series right now? It it's really comes down to just being able to to get the Oilers defense out of their game. I mean, especially in game three for the Panthers, where they were where you can ca- look at all those goals that the Panthers scored. And and it was because the of the Edmonton Oilers blue line fighting off the four check slower to pucks for uh, uh, for the Panthers, too. And getting getting them pucks deep because these are two contrasting styles with the Edmonton Oilers going getting speed through the neutral zone while the Panthers are a team that likes to dump it dump and chase and 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 go to battle there and actually creates chances off the forecheck so thankfully with the Panthers getting last change and Alexander Barkov being able to match up against McDavid that's that's a thing for for the Panthers that they're hoping to really get those lines going and First and third line have been really going. I mean, Matthew Kachuk has only has one goal in the last 15 games. He needs to get going a little bit. It, we, we have to, we still have to get killer instinct, Matthew Kachuk there. Him and Bennett, uh, ha, that that line has to get going. And they haven't gotten any contributions from the fourth line too, but that's not really a big expectation for the team. So maybe look to more to that second line to bring more uh, contributions to the Florida Panthers in game five because... We, we've seen Matthew Kachuk take over games, so ho- hopefully we we can see it, it end at home. One win away from the first Stanley Cup in franchise history. Obviously, we still don't know how it's going to end, but assuming the Panthers win it, who do you think should be the Conn Smythe Trophy winner? It's changed so many times uh, with with performances. I mean, when Sergei Bobrovsky got chased in, in Game 4, I didn't think that it was to his fault uh, of, of those five goals. I mean, just the the way that the Oilers were just getting multiple odd man rushes. But I think, I think of it, I think of it multiple ways of who who's contributing and Alex, it's between Alexander Barkov and Sergey Bobrovsky. And here's the thing. If Sergey Bobrovsky got a, a shot out in game one, but after, even if he gives up eight goals, but then has a clincher in a shot and a shutout along with it, I don't see a reason why it wouldn't be him because of the way he's able to bounce back. But also if Alexander Barkov gets like three or four points in, in a, in a clincher too, 
then then you have to consider him too. But it's between those guys. Uh, so it, it's uh, I'm, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say the odds have shifted a little bit with the with the performance of uh, on of the of Sergey Bobrovsky in game four. But it's it's really close. I would say. All right. Well, Armando, why don't you tell our viewers and our listeners where they could find the podcast and where they could find you on social media? They can find the podcast anywhere they listen to podcasts uh, and, and on YouTube. And they could also follow the show account on X and Instagram at LO underscore FLA Panthers. And they, if they want to po- uh, if they want to follow me personally, they could follow me at Mondo Man 12. All right, Armando. Always a pleasure. Thanks so much. And I know you'll have all things Panthers covered throughout the playoffs and beyond. Thank you so much, Gil, as always. Today's episode is brought to you by your friends at FanDuel. Summertime means baseball, the NBA Finals, the Stanley Cup Finals, and more. You can bet it all on FanDuel. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's 200 bucks you could use to bet on everything from the finals MVP to who's going to hit one out of the park. Hockey fans, use your knowledge of the NHL to bet on the Conn Smythe Trophy winner as the playoffs MVP. Who's going to win game five back in South Florida or who's going to win the Stanley Cup? All you have to do is visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and add a big win to your summer bucket list. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. It is my pleasure to welcome back to the show the host of Locked On NHL Utah, Robin Leano. And uh, Robin, not a lot of dull moments going on right now concerning this franchise. Uh, let's start with the nickname for the first year and the uniforms of a busy week out in Utah. Yeah, it's it ha- absolutely has been a, a busy week. You know, with the the deal officially quote closing. I mean, we already knew this was a. It, 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 we already knew it was happening. If everything was, you know, in motion, but officially closed as of uh, as of late last week. And the moment that happened, once. The, I think they made the post. The ink is now dry. Look at what they made on their post as they unveiled the new jerseys. Unveiled their their nickname is going to be Utah HC, only for season one because they'll have an they'll have their official name by season two. Um, I want to make sure everyone knows that because people have already seen the jerseys and seen the name and seen the word marks and have already thrown fits. It's only for season one. It's just like another Washington football team situation. What were your thoughts on the colors? Were, were you surprised by the choices uh, of, of the nickname for year one and the colors? Um, not, not definitely not surprised by the nickname. I, I kind of already figured it was going to be something very simple, something that you can easily tune to. Uh, Utah Hockey Club was just like the easiest that you can go with. Uh, made things a lot easier. Uh, as I mean, on the show, I still say. NHL in Utah. That's what we've been saying for the last two months. Uh, Utah HC just makes things so much easier just just for a broadcast and an identity sense. It just made things easier. So I was not surprised by that. Um, as I already know, they said, we're not going to have a real name until season two. We're not going to even worry about that. So that I, that, that, that I knew coming in. When in terms of the colors, I'm a little surprised. They kind of already teased it kind of over the last couple of months. They've shown the baby blue multiple times, that what they call mountain blue. Um, I was wondering for the longest time what was going to be those other colors. I was going to say maybe black, maybe a little bit of purple in there as, an, as, as a little bit of an homage to the earlier colors of the Utah Jazz when they got brought over from New Orleans over to Salt Lake City. So I figured, oh, you know what? I think that would be cool. Plus, I love the color purple, so maybe I was a little bit biased on that. Uh, but it works. The colors that they have, it's uh, officially rock black, salt white, and mountain blue. Um, with mountain blue, I think, being their third color. Logos look pretty good. Uh, nothing, to compl- n- nothing to write home about, but nothing to complain about either. Um, and jerseys, like I say, they're clean. Love the away jerseys. I don't know, I don't know what it is about me, Gil. The white, just white jerseys, I am a sucker for sometimes. 
Yeah, look, I, I when I started following hockey in the 70s, I know I'm dating myself here, but uh, home teams wore white and road teams wore the colors and that changed in the 90s. But, uh, you know, I, I sort of have a soft spot for white jerseys for that reason as well. Now, the team also did announce six final candidates for the permanent name, which, as you mentioned, will start in year two. Uh, what were the six finalists, and do you have a favorite at this point? Yeah, so as of right now, uh, the six finalists are, uh, well, let's start Utah HC, so they'll continue to use that name, um, as well as the other five being the Yeti, the Mammoth, the Outlaws, the Blizzard, and I'm blanking on the last one here. Um, mammoth. Did I say mammoth? I think I already said mammoth. Blizzard, mammoth, venom, blizzard, yeti. mammoth, yeti, outlaws, HC. Mammoth, outlaws, venom, yeti. That's five. There's six. Right. <laughs> I don't well, know why HC. I'm blanking on it. Yeah, HC. There you go. <laughs> um. Anyways, it's oh oh. Uh, I didn't. I don't think I mentioned venom. So ah okay. The one I was missing. See. And there, and there gives you an example. Not a huge fan of Venom because it's forgettable. Um, I usually keep forgetting that one. I used to like it, but I'm realizing now, again, it's forgettable. Uh, right. I would not would not like to see Utah HC continue. Um, I've only thought, again, it's a placeholder, just like Washington football team was for you NFL fans, you know, when they're transitioning from, from the Redskins on over to the Commanders. It's same same situation so please don't don't do that um the public from the public guy ever it seems that yeti is currently the most popular um and it is yeti no s so not yetis but right. yet um and then followed by the number two i believe mammoth is the second most popular which is my favorite uh from and that's strictly from a marketing perspective gil is taking a look at what the possibilities are for logos and word marks and uh, other kinds of potential jersey designs, <laughs> merchandise sales. I just feel that Mammoth has the most possibilities. Yeti does too. It has a lot of possibilities. Um, people have made the joke about, hey, why don't you make a, uh, a sponsorship deal with the, the cooler company? Right. Uh, I actually made a rebuttal, a rebuttal joke, and I'm like, hey, wouldn't that be awesome for the Utah Yeti, you know, sponsored by the Cooler Company to be in the Stanley Cup final? Um, it's <laughs> I, I, I love to make those kind of jokes, but no, for real, um, Mammoth has been my favorite, at least in the last couple of weeks. It's really, it wasn't even in my top five for a while, then it all of a sudden kind of just popped in there because I realized the potential it has. Now, the color scheme for year one is not guaranteed to follow in year two once they pick the permanent. This is campaign. the color scheme. So whatever – so the color scheme that we see now, those three colors will be the will be the colors for whatever the team is named. Okay. And that might give you an idea of what it probably was, it could potentially lean towards. It really those, – those three colors – very well fit the Yeti. That's why it's, that's what it almost feels like it is an in, 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 in inevitability. Uh, but it kind of fits the Mammoth. Of course, it still fits HC because any color at that point will. Um, and you can make it a you can make an argument that you can fit those colors in with Outlaws. But I feel like you have to get a little more creative with Outlaws and Venom. Um, with Blizzard, easy again, same thing. Um, and one thing I will add, Gil. No, a lot of people are sleeping on Blizzard. It is also in my top three, and it has become a big part of my top three for the reason being on and a very different, very, very different reason. And it is strictly to keep the double Z uh, identity that's going on of Utah, you know, Utah Jazz. Right. Uh, so then you got the Utah Blizzard 2Z. So, I mean, people told me that, and I'm like, you know what? I'm on board for that. So, yeah. like, I would be happy with Blizzard as well. All right. Now, what's next for this team during the offseason besides, you know, free agency and the draft, which every team is dealing with? But what's next for Utah HC? You know, they still got uh, I mean, you know, they're, I mean, they're, they're focusing on as much of the offseason as any as, as any other NHL team. Uh, Bill Armstrong is really it's really good to work cut out for him. I just look, I just took a look at 
you know, their salary cap table. And I mean, they've got $20 million until they even hit the salary floor. Wow. Um, so they've got money to work with. Yes. If we want to, if we want to go with, you know, look at all the actual details, they don't have any defensemen signed through the next year yet. So that obviously is going to command a decent chunk specific, you know, even bring back some of your guys but for the most part i they have so much money to work with they're going um i have a feeling you expect to see a team like this make a splash um to continue to build their way to a competitive team they will be a competitive team this year i have i i fully believe that are they going to be a playoff team probably not but what they're working towards and what the excitement is going around there they're like, I mean, it's going to mark, they're going to market themselves. The fans are already excited. I think what 34,000 uh, season ticket deposits that, which obviously even way over, you know, it is overshot what they're even what They can even hold in their arena. So, I mean, the t this city is ready for hockey. All right. Well, I know you'll have every step of the way covered for us, Robin. Why don't you tell our viewers and our listeners, where they can find the podcast and where they can find you on social media. Yep, you can find the podcast anywhere you can get your podcast on social media. We are on uh, on the uh, at formerly known as Twitter, now called X. It's at L O underscore N H L Utah. And I am personally at Robin underscore Leonio. All right, Robin. Thanks so much. Always a pleasure. Of course. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube, and now it's also available on Amazon Fire TV in the free Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channels app. I want to thank my guests today, Robin Leano of Locked On Utah HC, plus, of course, Nick Zareris of Locked On Oilers and Armando Velez of Locked On Florida Panthers for joining me today. I'm Gil Martin. I am here every Monday hosting Locked On NHL, and I co-host the Friday edition of the show along with Rachel Donner. Don't forget, we are here every Monday through Friday, bringing you the biggest stories from around the National Hockey League. So make sure you subscribe to Locked On NHL to get new episodes as soon as they drop. Have a great day, everybody. Stay safe. And thank you for listening to and watching the Locked On NHL podcast.